um, want to welcome you all here to this discussion. We've got about an hour. I um, also want to thank, obviously, the IAA for, for um, allowing us all to speak here, especially Sarah Busher, who has been instrumental in, in, in corralling us and herding the cats that are the speakers today. Um, and those speakers, uh, well, first of all, my name is George Rain. I'm a partner at Robeson Gray in Boston. Um, to my immediate left is Bob Toner, uh, who's Chief Legal Counsel for Investment Management at William Blair. Uh, to his left is Andrea Ottomanelli McGovern, one of the best names in government, um, who's branch chief in the chief counsel's office uh, in the Division of Investment Management at the SEC. Uh, past her uh, and at the far end is Joe Alessi, who's uh, deputy general counsel at Harris Associates. Uh, so we've got a, a Chicago uh, heavy crowd today. Um, because we only have an hour, uh, it's going to be somewhat of a selective discussion of uh, registered funds topics uh, and developments. Um, uh, we've uh, tried to select a few topics to spend some extra time on uh, that, with the hopes that they have broader appeal to the IAA audience. Um, uh, we're speaking really to sponsors of mutual funds, but also certainly sub-advisors to mutual funds. Um, uh, obviously, there are many other mutual fund issues out there, but that's sort of the crowd we're focusing on. But hopefully, between that, that crowd, we've got uh, most of the people in the room. Uh, also, we're limiting what we're talking about because we're conscious that other panels at the same conference are, are covering topics that hit uh, mutual funds. So we'll try to avoid those as well. Uh, and we'll also rely to some degree on uh, the fact that we have a fair number of written materials in your, in your packets, um, and we won't go through repeating those. Those relate largely to the, um, to the uh, rule proposals and recent rule developments. Uh, we certainly encourage questions. Uh, we will try to reserve uh, some time at the very end as well, but if you have a burning desire to interject or to correct, uh, feel free to do so at any time. Just wave your arms frantically, and we will try to recognize you. Um, so just, I guess we can start off, let's see if I can make this go forward, um, with just a quick overview of a couple of uh, rulemaking uh, uh, developments. Uh, the first I think want to touch on quickly, taking into account that obviously it is uh, a uh, discussed in some detail in the, in the written materials, uh, so the derivatives re-proposal, and I think, Joe, you were going to sort of lead us off. Sure. So I'm not going to regurgitate the rule, but for those of you who have dealt with derivatives and mutual funds over the you know, past several years, you know that this rule truly is transformative. Um, I have to say that of all the SEC initiatives, this, this one, they really hit it out of the box. So we have this patchwork of regulation around the use of derivatives from 10 triple six to about 30 some no action letters to pronouncements from examiners around cash settled futures to prominent lawyers at prominent law firms saying what you should and shouldn't segregate, right? And I think the SEC recognized during their sweep a few years back that it's still kind of all over the place, right? And if any of you do sub, um, work with subdivisors, you'll know that their segregation may not be exactly the way you're doing it at your shop. And so um, when the first proposal came out, it was like, well, it's kind of more of the same. Um, but with the new proposal, the staff has moved to what I think is a, a, a home run. Because when you sit down with your portfolio managers and you try to explain the segregation concept, and how that delevers the fund, they look at you like, no it doesn't. Um, and, and then when you find out, when you tell them, you know, if this particular derivative blows up, guess what? These assets we segregate, we're gonna have to use all those. And they look at you like, what, why? How, did, how does that achieve the, the, um, the goal of delevering the fund? So academics aside, right, the SEC has moved to this bar-based um, test and that's perfect because VAR is something portfolio managers get. They get risk metrics, they get VAR, you know, they, they understand back testing, they understand metrics, right? So when now when you sit down with a portfolio manager, you can explain this to him or her, um, and you have what I think puts all the different fund shops out there using derivatives more or less on an equal playing field, right? So, 
but there are some pitfalls in the rule um, that I want to that I want to highlight. One, if you don't think the rule applies to you because you don't use derivatives, you're wrong. The rule applies to virtually everyone in the room. Um, you might not have to have an entire program, a risk manager, but even if you use derivatives to equitize cash, if you use them to hedge, you still have to develop policies and procedures reasonably designed to ensure your fund is um, um, within various risk, risk parameters. So the rule applies to everyone, um, but and especially if you can't meet the de minimis threshold, then all the, you know, all the bells and whistles of the rules kick in. The other thing I think you should be aware of is that, like most shops, portfolio managers just want to run a strategy. They don't want to be told I'm running you know, a, a, a USIT, an OIC, um, a mutual fund, a hedge fund. They just say, this is my strategy, Joe. Um, you guys wrap it however you want and sell it wherever you want. So if you have an EU-based fund now that uses derivatives, you need to know that the, that the limitations there are actually a bit higher than what the SEC has, has um, outlined in their uh, reproposal. So the strategies won't be peri passu, uh, if you will, if, um, if you're running uh, strategies in both countries. Though, Joe, you, you, you mentioned VAR, the value at risk. That would be a concept, at least, that's very common for a European-based fund. Right? Absolutely. And they do follow the VAR test. It's just that their limitation is a bit higher, so you can actually be a little more levered in that jurisdiction. Um, I think, you know, one thing you should also know is there's a very short implementation period around the rule. And I think the other thing I would mention is that there's probably a number of CCOs in the room. So li listen, um, I know that you guys have dealt with derivatives because you've been dealing with this, these, this patchwork, right? But when you really look at what the rule requires, I'm not sure, and I've been a CCO too, so, but, but I'm not sure that most CCOs are going to be equipped with or understand how to administer the program. So unless it's a, a pretty simple shop, if you will, you're going to need to start thinking about hiring somebody um, who, who can do it. Um, so I think you really want to consider that uh, soon. And I guess that's really my Great. comments on the rule. Thank you. Uh, well, we'll maybe uh, move on to sort of the exemptive application proposal. Um, and uh, I think, um, Andrea, you were going to give a little bit of quick, quick overview of kind of what this is and what the importance is. Sure, yeah, I'm happy to. Um, before I start, I'll just give the standard disclaimer that uh, the views that I'll express today are my own and not those of the commission, the commissioners, or any of the other staff at the SEC. Uh, so as George mentioned, uh, another one of the proposals that's out right now from the SEC has to do with the exemptive applications process under the Investment Company Act. Um, and what this would do is it would create a expedited review procedure for routine applications, uh, so those that are substantially identical to precedent. And if the application met that criteria, then it would be um, granted a notice within 45 days, um, which is obviously faster than the process is now. Um, the rule also would provide for a specific time frame by which the staff would provide comments to applicants, so that would be 90 days on any applications or amendments. And then it would make any um, applications on which the applicant hasn't responded to staff comments in 120 days, um, it would deem them withdrawn. The comment period for this rule uh, closed in November, and the staff is currently reviewing the comments that we received and determining the best way to move forward. So is this, is this a big difference or a big departure from sort of internal rules that currently exist, or is, what, what would be the big impact of having a, now a formal rule out there as opposed to just an internal processes? So I think the, the big impact is the expedited review for, the, uh, for certain exemptive applications. Um, I mean, we keep coming out with rules, so I think the group of routine applications is shrinking, uh, but we do still have some. So for those applications, it would really allow people to get in and out of the door pretty quickly. Great. Well, thank you. Um, the uh, next, I think the last sort of rule proposal that we're, we're going to talk about is partly a rule adoption, but, but also some 
uh, ongoing developments, uh, which would be sort of on the ETF uh, rule uh, adoption, which was adopted as a formal rule last summer, um, speaking to the point of, of, of exemptive orders. There, there had been obviously a long uh, collection of exemptive orders that you needed in order to launch an ETF, and this rule um, uh, actually uh, rescinded those orders and replaced them for most ETFs, uh, what we would call plain vanilla ETFs, uh, and interestingly did such things as breaking down the distinction between active and passive ETFs, which had long been a, a distinction in the letters, or excuse me, in the exemptive orders, uh, and also tried to level the playing field um, uh, with respect to um, custom baskets and, and operational matters that uh, where some bigger shops that had longer standing uh, exemptive orders uh, had been uh, benefiting from when later people who had later orders were unable to do so. So I think that was really a, a, an effort to, to level the playing field with, with um, exemptive orders um, and, uh, and has been, um, I think has been well received as, 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 uh, by the industry. Um, I, I think the, the, the next phase of this uh, came through uh, further exemptive orders, um, which I think, Andrea, you were going to speak to a bit, um, which really come to the question of, uh, of uh, non-transparent or partly transparent active ETFs. And maybe you can give a little bit of a uh, sense of what, when those were put out, uh, noticed, and, and kind of what the implication of the, that additional uh, set of exemptive orders is. Sure, so it's been a pretty busy year for the SEC and ETFs. Um, I, I look at the non-transparent ETF relief that's come out in sort of two phases. The first was in May of 2019 with the order for Presidian, and then the second in December of 2019 um, with four orders uh, for T. Rowe Fidelity, Blue Tractor, and Natixis. Um, they all operate uh, one model or one type of model that we call the proxy portfolio model, and then Presidian is another model. Um, if you take your, you know, typical ETFs now that there are subject to this new rule, you know, they have daily portfolio transparency and that's how you um, can ensure efficient arbitrage. Uh, not surprisingly, a lot of uh, actively managed um, uh, folks don't want to have daily portfolio transparency. They don't want to give away their secret sauce. So they came to us looking for a way to offer an ETF where they didn't make their portfolio public every day. And those are these non-transparent models. The Presidian model would accomplish this um, in two ways. One, it would um, create a new entity in the uh, creation and redemption process with ETFs called an authorized participant representative, an AP rep. And if an AP wants to create shares with an ETF, it would go through that AP rep. So only the AP rep knows what's in the portfolio on that day. So an AP brings its cash to the AP rep, the AP rep goes out into the market, gets the securities in the basket, and delivers them to the ETF. At the same time, the funds are uh, calculating and disseminating every second of the trading day a verified intraday indicative value, or a VIIV. Um, and in that uh, circumstance, the manager has taken responsibility for that calculation and dissemination. They're responsible for the oversight of that information. Uh, the fund is limited into the types of securities that it can invest in, only U.S. exchange traded, so that the pricing inputs into that VIV should be reliable. And the basket is a pro rata share of the portfolio. With the proxy portfolios, I think that's a more typical uh, creation and redemption process than what you would see today. The AP would just go directly to the ETF. But instead of publishing on a daily basis the ETF's portfolio, the fund will publish a proxy portfolio, which is designed to track the daily performance of the actual portfolio. They'll also uh, be required to publish a portfolio overlap number. So this will be a percentage number that shows the difference between the actual and the proxy portfolio. Um, there's a little bit of a wrinkle there with one of the uh, proxy portfolio applicants, Blue Tractor. Um, their proxy model is a little bit different in that uh, the proxy will have all of the same names, only the weight will differ from what's in the actual portfolio. So rather than a portfolio overlap percentage, they'll do um, a percentage up and down on each security. So the security can vary by one to 2%, for example. All of these applicants are subject to protective conditions because these are new products. We're not sure how they're going to operate in the market, and we want folks to know that these aren't the same as the ETFs that they're, they're used to seeing out there today. So um, there's disclosure requirements, including a legend and all of the marketing um, materials, prospectuses that basically say, 
hey, this isn't the same as a regular ETF. And, and by the way, because um, there's not as much information out there about this ETS portfolio, the spreads may be wider, the premium and discounts may be larger. Uh, they're also subject to regulation FD, which other ETFs are not subject to. And um, there are certain monitoring requirements. One requires periodic reporting to the staff um, about how the ETF is working in the market because these are new and we want to make sure that they're working the way that they were intended to work. And there are also thresholds for the board to meet and consider, is everything working with the fund? And these are thresholds that center around the spread, the premium, the discount, and for the proxy portfolios, the tracking error between the proxy and the actual portfolio. So, so is, uh, is the sense that these are workable options, this is a, this is a long-term play that this will actually work for the ETF industry or is this kind of chapter one and we'll kind of feel our way forward as the regulator and the, and the industry kind of work, try to work this out? I think from our standpoint, it's a matter of making sure that there could be efficient arbitrage. I mean, that's what the commission was concerned about when it was looking at these applications as to whether or not they'll take off. That's not really for us to, to speculate on or determine. I, I personally think that one of the models is going to be <coughs> is going to be the big winner, yeah. um, and uh, advisors are going to flock to that particular model, and we're going to see the other ones die out. That's just my you know, opinion. Interesting. I don't know okay. which one, but <laughs> interesting. Uh, we'll, I agree. We'll, 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 we'll see. We'll, we'll we'll see where it goes. Um, mm -hmm. Well, now we can kind of pivot a little bit from uh, from new new very very new things to almost uh, as new things. Um, because we thought it'd be sort of a helpful um, uh, moment to kind of get some insight from from um, from Bob and from Joe on on the liquidity risk management rule, which was adopted a year ago, uh, or was went effective almost a year ago. We're now coming up on the uh, for many firms their first annual report of their liquidity risk manager. Um, I've have heard um, and, and don't haven't. Written, just within the last day, I heard that the, um, the SEC staff has been actually reaching out to managers um, to have conversations of inf informational conversations about how they're, they're um, operating their liquidity risk management program, uh, especially where the managers are running either floating rate funds, bank loan funds, or to some extent high yield funds, uh, and they're calling up and trying to just understand how are you categorizing, what are the, some of the approaches you're using. So that's hot off the presses in terms of a, what is not a suite, but rather telephone calls with big managers saying, would you like to talk to us a little bit, bit how, about how this is going? So with that, maybe turn, turn it over to Bob and Joe and give a sense of, from your perspectives, you know, what's been working, what's not been working upon implementation, anything that's been a surprise as you've been implementing the liquidity risk management rule, um, and, and I think maybe focus a little bit about how board interactions and reporting has been going from your perspective. So I don't know, sure. Bob, do you want to kick it off? Yeah, I'll kick it off. Uh, don't feel like I've been pulling my weight here, so. <laughs> oh, <you're laughs> so uh, cur currently I work at a firm that has a very heavy equity focus, but um, uh, th those days are going to end soon because we just brought in a new emerging market debt team. Uh, so that'll be a, a, an interesting exercise here. But uh, even with that, uh, we worked with our uh, custodian who has an off-the-shelf kind of solution that we started with, and we use that as kind of the the focal point, the jumping off point to see, okay, well, what is it that the rest of the industry is doing to try to get, you know, a, a real sense of how other people are thinking about this. And, you know, it's one of the, one of the bigger custodians, so they have uh, a lot of interactions with a lot of, uh, a lot of different fund players. Um, but, so under the umbrella of the rule, we didn't feel like having an off the shelf solution was gonna really, really meet the, you know, the spirit of the rule even in a situation like ours where you don't have a tremendous number of truly illiquid securities. And so uh, we, we had, um, kind of picking up on something that Joe said before, there's a gentleman that uh, I believe he's been told he's probably going to be the derivatives, uh, liquid, uh, der derivatives risk manager in, in addition to being a liquidity risk manager. But you now we really were looking at you know, the, uh, the way to best have a an independent check of somebody who has an investment management background who uh, chairs a committee that we have that includes people from the compliance, from the operational, and from the investment side uh, to really make sure that we're all understanding uh, you know, what it is that we're looking at because I, I, I think the it's 
easy enough to say that you need to test for liquidity. I think when you get into the weeds, it becomes a little bit more challenging. Uh, I don't know, Joe, if, uh, for you guys, I know it's your current shop, it's mostly equities as well, but. It's mostly equities, yeah. Right, right. So that's, I, I empathize with, and I won't ask anybody to raise hands, but I used to work at a large purveyor of uh, bank loan funds, so it's it, it gets even more interesting because um, there are, it's a very different structure for that part of the market, and um, I'm happy to talk to anybody offline about that because I haven't really looked at it from from the liquidity rule perspective. Well, and when you look at the release, the both proposing and the adopting release, you could have replaced you know, liquidity with bank loans. I mean, bank yeah, loans was right. really sort of the, the the model that shows up as if the, the image they had in their mind is the, as the as the commission's uh, uh, release is being drafted because that's really that's the crystallizes a lot of the issues, and it's, so right. it's not surprising that the staff is is now sort of reaching out. And, and at this time too, because people have, have you know had a year to live with this rule and and, right. and, it's, and it's being operationalized. Are you guys getting the sense you've got it bedded down pretty well in terms of how it's going to run? How your reports are working, interactions with the board. How that how's that going for you guys? You know, I, you know, I would say first off that um, it's actually much smoother than I really had anticipated. Um, I think what one of the things could you ask what works well, what hasn't. I have to say that, and I'm not throwing any particular vendor under the bus, please don't look at it that way, but the use of the outside vendors, I think, was a little more challenging than we had thought. Mm -hmm. um, we thought it was, you know, a cure-all. It turned out not to be. Um, <laughs> it turned out to be a lot of operational challenges around that. Um, and the other thing I would say, uh, in terms of what's worked really well, and Bob's touched on this, but this concept of who you're liquidity risk manager is, there's a lot of flexibility in the rule. So at our shop, we appointed the advisor, but then we have a person who basically administers the rule, yep. and he has a team of people on a committee. Um, and that committee includes two PMs, but the majority aren't uh, portfolio managers, and they can't be under the rule. And that has worked extremely well for us. Um, and you know, it kind of takes the pressure off a person. Um, and it puts what is a, if, if any of you have ever sat on valuation committees, you know that this, these issues are difficult. Um, and they're some of the hardest decisions you make sometimes. Um, one of the areas, if I had a crystal ball, um, I would say that if you're a manager of managers or um, uh, have sub-advisors, there's no doubt going to be a point where the valuations that you're selecting may be different from the sub-advisor or vice versa. Um, in the SEC FAQs, they've addressed that because the industry is like, what do we do? Um, and the SEC did address it and they give you a lot of flexibility about what you can do. But what I would say to people in the room is that you better document that and you better have a clear procedure around it because no doubt this will be fertile grounds for SEC examinations and enforcement actions. Sure as I sit here. Um, <laughs> so maybe I do have a crystal ball, but I really do believe that that's gonna be an area of focus. Um, and, and one of the other things I would say that um, hasn't worked well is this concept of understanding um, your shareholder base, right? Mm -hmm. Especially if your funds are sold through wirehouses and the omnibus accounts it's really hard to get a sense of how, how much of that could we lose on any given day. You know, you go out and you talk to your marketing people and they're like, you know, I know that we're on such and such watch list. I can tell you with certainty on some things, but not on everything. So that, that becomes a difficult exercise too, I would say. Well, it's, it, it, for what I've heard, it's always a backward looking exercise. Yeah. So it's a lot like just doing, you know, the, securities liquidity analysis where everybody runs the 2008-2009 model. Right. Everybody does a few other scenarios where they look and they say, okay, well, how did, how did these kinds of securities perform then? Uh, so it's the same way with funds, you know? When did we have a big drawdown of mm -hmm. shareholders? Um, you know, the last couple of weeks, I'm sure there have been a lot of conversations around that and whether or not people were feeling comfortable that they had uh, enough liquidity. And um, you know, we, we recently had uh, a situation where a large client decided to move from one fund to another fund, and we worked very closely with our board. We worked very closely with 
portfolio managers and the clients to make sure that we did it in as seamless a way as possible. But it did have some, some liquidity implications, too, that we had to yeah. keep an eye on. Yeah, and I think that was always one of the criticisms that it, when you have a backward-looking structure, it's only as good as the, the, yes. the, con the continuity between the history and the future, and, and it works until, the, until, it, until it all falls apart. Mm -hmm. I'm sure we could go for quite a while on this one, but I think we might want to sort of move along to, uh, in the interest of, of, of time, uh, move along to uh, fund disclosure, uh, which is always a fun topic, um, uh, which I can sort of kick off a little bit. Uh, we have a couple of topics here. Uh, and certainly, um, uh, we'll we'll uh, uh, we'll actually get to some um, some really interesting developments even this week on on disclosure with with the SEC coming out with a request for comment. Um, but certainly, starting with sort of risk disclosures, and maybe we'll take these one after the other and, as we go. And um, you know, certainly, um, one topic that had got a lot of press was the question of alphabetical versus other ordering of risks. Um, certainly we've seen a couple of speeches came out on that. Some uh, certainly been getting the comments that how can it be that your risks have uh, happened to be uh, in, in order of importance based on where they, they stand in the alphabet. That can't be the case. Um, so certainly I think a lot of folks have put a, put a fair amount of thought into what risks do we put in? Do you limit the number of risks, in which case you might be able to order them? Or do you think, well, maybe we should have more risks and figure out some other approach? And I, I, I'm certainly partial to the, the approach of saying, let's pick maybe somewhere between four or five, stick them at the front, and then have everything else be alphabetical. But I don't know what, whether you guys have risk, risk uh, uh, inspirations um, um, and, and maybe what, if there are any risks you guys have been thinking a lot about recently, because I've certainly seen a few. But, but any, on the risk side, thoughts? So um, real life experience, we, that situation I was talking about before, we had gone through a, um, a big 485A filing and about a week before the filing was supposed to go live, the examiner was giving her comments and she said, you know, I, we, ha we have this uh, desire for people to move away from this alphabetical or in our case, the risk disclosures they felt were a little too clustered. Uh, but I will give the examiner credit. Uh, she said, it, "Yeah, I didn't bring this up uh, soon enough, so we're not going to uh, we're not going to enforce that on you this time." And then, unfortunately, within uh, six months, we were doing another A filing, so we couldn't pretend that we hadn't heard that. Uh, not that we ever would, you know. Just, uh, but the um, yeah, the the reality is, we ended up in a place like you were describing, George, where we tried to, with some hesitation for the lawyers, because it's always a, a calculated risk, but we tried to come up with the four or five things that really were front and center, and uh, knowing that there is the possibility that somebody could come along and say, you know, well, well, you didn't identify this sixth thing that was, you know, the really big thing. And it's it, it gets hard, and I think it's hard for both sides, both the disclosure staff and, and for us, but I am waiting for the first comment that you really ought to have some coronavirus uh, disclosure in there because, I, you know, it, it, it can get a little bit uh, overwrought, so hopefully we don't get there. To, to, to paraphrase George Orwell, um, all risks are principal, but some risks are more principal than others. Yep. But, um, but yeah, I mean, coronavirus, that's certainly something people have, I've seen about three or four emails. Does anyone have coronavirus risk? It's like, not yet. Yeah. Not yet. So I got to say, um, I've always been fine with alphabetical. And I thought when Dahlia, Dahlia gave her first speech, I'm like, this is crazy. Um, but she gave the speech again. Right, and so what Dahlia wants, Dahlia gets. Um, we capitulated like probably everyone else in the room um, and we, we switched it up. So I think that's just the reality of, of where, we're, where we're at with the, the, the risk disclosure. I think some other tr trends that maybe over the year that I've seen and you know, feel free to jump in a few other ones, but certainly the looking for pandemics and making sure that your market risk picks up things that the world could come to an end and mm -hmm. apocalypse risk and all that. <laughs> um, um, but you know, Brexit certainly has been an area that people have yeah. been trying to work yeah. on disclosure. Um, um, it's not necessarily risk disclosure, but maybe maybe it is. It's sort of there. There is a risk of Brexit, um, and also LIBOR transition has been something that I think uh, have been people have been spending a fair amount of time on as sort of ways in which we can tweak the either the characteristics or the risks of the types of disclosure we have. Any any other sort of themes you're seeing? Uh, no. So I will confess. I think both LIBOR and Brexit made it into our prospectuses. Although I think the LIBOR one for us is in the SAI, um, but that may be making a, a reappearance in the uh, prospectus with the new EMB funds that we'll be putting together. 
Um, no, I, I, I think it, it always is a balancing act. Um, and I always tell young lawyers that, uh, you know, you got to really focus in, you got to get, get the language right, even though no one is going to read it. And, um, you know, then you, you, you hope for the best. And um, so we do try to write it in a way that is accessible to people, spend a lot of time on the summary perspectives because that's, that's a document I think that is digestible for people. And um, that's where we really put the focus there. And I, I, will, I will say I, I benefit from the fact that uh, a member of my team is a former uh, SEC lawyer. She had a very wide career in OC and enforcement, that sort of thing. And uh, she really keeps people honest about Will and May. Uh, because well, yeah, 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 the will and May. Yeah, the will and May. So, to, what, what's the what's your will and May solution? What's the problem? What's the solution on will versus May? So, I mean, anytime you talk to anybody from the the staff, and we do have these conversations internally, uh, and and I will confess that my career has been um, scattered with the word May all over every document I've ever written, yeah. uh, because you there are a lot of situations where you just don't know, and uh, the best you can get somebody to say is, well, we may do that. And I, I do think it, it may come, it may seem like it's coming down to just those two words, but or it really does. It will come down to it, those two words. It, it may it come down to those two words or will it? It might. Huh? Yeah, there you go. But it, it does, I think, help if you can get the engagement of the people who are the portfolio managers or otherwise to get rid of some of the fluff. You know, if you say to them, like, if they say, well, we might do that, well, what, what do you mean you may, you may or might do that? Are you going to do that? or how frequently will you do that? And it can get some conversations going. And uh, not, not that they're always pleasant conversations because people get a little irritated because it feels a little, a little bit semantic. Yeah, so following up on that theme, I, I personally think the litmus test is will and do. Do mm -hmm. you do it? If you do it, it's a will, yeah. right? And if you look at the case, it was very clear that it wasn't a may. They did it. Yeah. So it should be a will. Um, having said that, I don't think you should run away and scrub all your documents and get rid of the word may, because there are very legitimate reasons to continue to use the word may. But I think it just goes back to, it's a reality. Do you do it? If you do it, it's a will. I think it's really that simple. Well, I, I mean, to take a little bit of, of nuance on that point, I mean, there, especially if you're launching a new fund, for instance, mm -hmm. you say, well, will you do this? Well, I don't know. You don't, well, you know. don't know because we haven't done anything yet. We'll see what the market says. And, you know, you may have a portfolio manager comes in and, and, and I remember one that came in and said, I want to run this fund hot, which yeah. means I want to do everything but nothing. <laughs> or I could do anything, but it's like, well, I don't know what that means. They I can't write, I want to run the fund hot. <laughs> but, but, you can, but without having to say it that way, you can build in some of this more specificity and actually really improve the disclosure if you say something along the lines of, you know, we intend to do this, but we may, not, but there may be circumstances where we don't, or we don't intend to be, um, uh, to, to have a significant exposure to this type of investment, however we reserve the, the freedom or the, the flexibility. And there are ways to really indicate, you know, is this a focus, is it not a focus? Um, and, you know, in some ways it was triggered by that kind of, we don't want to say may, but maybe will is a little too strong. So it's an interesting one. I want to switch quickly to sort of ESG disclosures, because um, uh, that's something that's been, for, you know, funds that are out there, has been a real focus uh, of the staff when you have anything with the word sustainable or ESG or, or um, SRI in the name of the fund. Um, it's certainly a theme. There's a panel on ESG tomorrow, which I'm sure will be informative, but um, it, uh, it, it is uh, something where the real question is ESG, is it a type of investment um, or is it a, a style of investing? Um, the, 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 first of all, the question on it, is it an 80% test? Does it trigger an 80% test? And you get that comment all the time and all of my clients seem to push back and basically say, this is how we think about investing. There's not an ESG stock. Um, it is just, it is simply a, a way of investing and a theme. But I don't know if you've had your experience with, if you've had an experience with ESG products or, or ESG disclosure about products that may not be labeled as such. Well, we, we definitely have. Uh, so it's interesting for, for any manager that has clients in Europe, uh, they take the issue much, much more seriously than the average client here in the U.S. And so having the conversations with them can, can really help you focus. And the first thing you have to you know, decipher is, okay, is it a socially responsible approach or is it 
an ESG sustainability approach. And so socially responsible, uh, you know, there's some great firms. One I, I, I used to do some work in connection with is uh, Domini. Uh, and they are social, a socially responsible fund. They are investing with the idea of, you know, doing good and, hope, you know, hopefully the, uh, the investment performance will follow. I, I think a lot of people fall into the category that we do, which is it's more of an investment approach. I mean, we look, and good governance has always been a big, big thing for probably most, if not all, managers. Uh, but we've also been, especially over the last two years, really focused in on, so what about the sustainability aspects of that? You know, don't just look at the, the financial metrics and don't just look at the pure numbers. Look beneath it and say, okay, are these, are these firms actually talking about sustainability efforts? Are they doing things, uh, even if they're not highlighting it so that they get more credit for it? And we've really been engaging with the various um, companies in order to get better data. You know, there's some vendor data out there, but it's, it is what it is. One, one thing I've heard, I, had a, I was at a board meeting with an economist, uh, a finance professor yesterday, who's been doing sort of regression analyses of different labeling by different service providers, and the overlap between them or the, is about 30%. If you take one provider, right. is this an ESG? What are the, you know, what score high for this one? What score high for that one? There's almost no overlap between exactly. two different, two different uh, vendor right. no, categorizations. It, it, exactly, and what I say, when I think of ESG, I think, ugh. Like, what is it? Can anyone really define it? Um, and I bet we could have a debate all day about what is ESG. Um, and so, you know what, but what I would say is that you, you want to think about it more broadly than just your prospectus, right? So a lot of firms have, um, as George mentions, um, products where it's investment style. It's not necessarily a, a sustainable fund, but it's part of your style of investing. And I think a lot of firms have signed on to various principles around the world, right? right? And they'll put those on their website. So once you do that, guess what? You're making a, a representation um, about how you invest. And therefore, you have to make sure that that's in fact what's going on at your shop. Um, but again, I think there's, this is just going to be fertile ground for years to come. And I'm not, I, I'm not saying I'm against ESG. It's, you know, it's a great thing. Uh, socially responsibility is a great thing. I just think that you can drive a truck through this stuff. Um, and I think it's difficult for the regulators to figure out, and it's difficult for um, uh, asset management firms to figure out. But the folks in Europe are all about it, yeah. and they, they're all uh, they're on top of it. And so if you manage any of their money, you have to be on top of it. And I, I think, is it this year or next year that there is going to be something coming from one of the many uh, European entities mm -hmm. saying, okay, this is what it means. This is what it and, means. That, and that'll be fascinating to see because yeah. I, I agree with you, Joe. So it goes back kind of to paraphrase something you said. It's kind of like you're, uh, you were advised, you know, say what you do, do what you say. Mm -hmm. So it's the same kind of thing where when you look and you say, yep, yeah, we're sustainable, that's just a word on the page. It doesn't mean anything. And I think that's the thing that uh, people from the, from the staff of the commission are looking at, which is, okay, well, help me understand what it is that you're doing. And so there's been, you know, for us and for a lot of people in the industry, a lot of collateral trying to explain how it is that we're looking at that to make it clear that we're not running a pure socially responsible uh, strategy, but we are, you know, looking to do things in a way that uh, will demonstrate that we, we actually do care about these things uh, with different weightings in different industries. But it is, I mean, you're right, just as an example, you can have a debate. Somebody says, well, I'm not going to look at, you know, carbon emission for a financial services company. Okay, why wouldn't you do that, right? right? So who are they lending money to and so on and so forth. So it, it can get really sticky really quick. And, and here's another thing, folks. Um, it, it, it's gone, it, this is getting beyond just ESG and your principles that you stand for. Um, so our firm was recently all about a Bloomberg article that alleged that our portfolio manager um, is contributing personal money to um, uh, organizations that are anti-climate change, right? Mm -hmm. So now we're having investors, or potentially regulators, this isn't a hint, um, saying, okay, so your PMs run the portfolio like this, but he's an anti-climate guy. How could that be? He's an anti-Greta person. <laughs> um, so, so you're starting to see some of that as well. 
Um, and I think that that is a very, uh, very slippery slope. Well, we can certainly, there'll be plenty of conversation <laughs> about the ESG and those slopes. Um, we did want to put folks on, on notice that uh, there was a, uh, a request for comment that came out two days ago from the staff um, on, on the question of the names rule. So it's re quite relevant yeah. to ESG because that's one of the themes that shows up. Uh, it'll be 60 days for the industry to comment. Um, and, and on questions relating to the names rule, should we have a names rule? Should it be changed? How, how should we think about the names of mutual funds? Um, it's, it's really kind of, I, my view on it, it's, it's a mixture, um, and you know, Andrew, you're welcome to comment if you want, you certainly don't have to, um, but it, you know, it seems a part of a theme of, of outreach. You know, this, the staff really wants to hear, before they go making rules, want to hear about um, the, how is this rule working? Um, there's sort of, there's a bit of an asymmetry of information that a lot of the discussion or the visibility that the staff has to the, the workings of the names rule is in the context of the disclosure people talking to a bunch of lawyers who are telling them that they want to have a test this way or that way and they're not seeing, other, aside from maybe published articles, they're not seeing a lot about the, the impact of names. Um, obviously the concern and ESG is a perfect example a lot of the concern is that you know, there's, there are these incentives to differentiate your products uh, in what, what's referred to as an increasingly competitive environment uh, and saying, well, ESG must be the thing that'll sell my fund even though it, has not, it may not have anything to do with what I'm actually doing. Or I've been doing this this way for 50 years, but it looks kind of like ESG. Let's call it ESG and we can sell more funds. Um, so that's certainly a concern underlying it. I don't know if you're welcome to comment on that or you can keep mum. <laughs> I think you're going to keep mum. I'm probably going to keep mum. Yeah. Keep mum on that but one. I, we'll wait I, for well, comments. I'm yeah. going to invite yeah. everybody to comment. Well, what, what I would say, and going back to the yeah. derivatives rule, I, I do think, and you can tell whoever you like at the uh, staff, it has been an encouraging thing. And I think totally. we in the industry hopefully are getting better about not being nervous about saying, well, this is what we do. This is how we're approaching it. Because for the derivatives rule especially, and then for the funds names rule, rather than just trying to write rules in a vacuum, which I know uh, the staff doesn't like to do, just having the conversation and saying, okay, you know, if you look at the CSG thing, it really, you, you can't, it's not a thing, you can't point to it, it's an approach. So maybe we should think long and hard before we uh, put that under the fund name rule. But I, I think the dialogue has really been very productive. Yeah, and just as an aside, right, so you're an ESG firm, right? You stand for all these principles, yet your CEO and your senior executives fly around on private jets. Um, your office doesn't recycle. Um, you know, your office throws away the lunch instead of giving it to the homeless. Um, so, and I say that not to be just controversial, but because if you really think about it, um, I think the regulators, if we have a crystal ball, and I think um, your institutional investors, especially those from Europe, are going to start asking you those types of questions. Mm -hmm. How did your CEO get here today? Oh, she flew in on a private jet. Oh, what's the carbon blue, uh, print of that? Right? So, um, and I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. I'm just throwing it out there as something I think we, you know, we're, we're going to see at some point. Mindful, mindful of the time. Thank you uh, for the, the insights into into the, those are these are topics that are really going to be resonating for years. Um, uh, on just on the names rule uh, uh, question, just the things that they focused on. There's some really fascinating. It's worth worth reading through. There's some really fascinating uh, uh, statistics in there. Um, they're certainly focused on market changes over the last couple of decades. The increased use of derivatives. They noted that 40 per, 41 percent of funds use derivatives was an interesting fact in that one. Um, rise of index funds is something that's a, a focus for names rule, because if you name your fund after an index, wh how does the regulation work? But going from, in 2001, there were 432 index funds, and now there are 2,311 of them. Um, ESG funds, funds with certain words in their name, went from 65 in 2007 up to 291 now. So really interesting developments, and that's what's focused on. Also looking at global and international, which is a bugaboo from, from, for years and years, uh, as well as the use of tickers, and whether those should be somehow, if they're part of the sell, sales process. So really interesting release. I'd certainly encourage folks to be thinking about that and, and commenting, as, as Andrea says. Um, do want to move on. Um, 
We'll probably want to cut this a little bit short, but um, maybe want to speak a little bit about OC uh, on registered funds and maybe some any sort of uh, uh, insights, takeaways, and anything. Andrew, anything from from the OC or SEC perspective and and uh, and and thoughts on on priorities and, and the like. Sure. Um, so I would. I would just um, point out that the, the um, OC 2020 priorities are out there. They came out in January. It's a 30-page document. It's available on the website. You can check it out. Um, the priorities, I think, tend to be quite similar to what they were in 2019, but maybe building out on some of those. Um, the, the, for instance, one of the big ones is a focus on um, retail investors, particularly um, seniors and those saving for retirement. Um, also, any funds that are sort of geared towards retail investors, there's a focus there as well. Uh, market infrastructure, again, just making sure that um, all of the entities that are providing critical services to the markets are, um, have policies and procedures that can make sure that they're resilient in times of stress. Um, information security, not a big surprise. Everybody's concerned about cyber uh, security risks there, so that's another focus. Um, as far as registrant exams, you know, looking at um, investment advisors, uh, I think this is always the case, but there's a focus on new advisors and those who haven't been examined in a while. Um, there's also going to be a focus on dual registrants and those who are affiliated with broker-dealers. Um, and speaking of ESG, those <laughs> who have new and emerging strategies, including ESG. Um, on IC exams, there will, uh, will be a focus again on funds that haven't been previously examined, um, funds that use a third party administrator as a sponsor, so like turnkey shops, and then um, those who have investment advisors that also have private funds with similar strategies. That's the side by side management was, mm -hmm. a, was a trend that's been out there, and yeah, turnkey would be like series trusts or, or service providers. Yeah, yes. Interesting. Uh huh. And then um, in the BD space, not surprisingly new this year is uh, what broker dealers are doing to get ready to implement Reg BI. Um, a few other focuses um, for the priorities in 2020 are uh, anti money anti money laundering uh, programs, just making sure that they're compliant with all the regulations in that space. Digital assets and robo advisors. Um, you know, big hot topics and they continue to be. So in the digital asset space, looking at things like suitability, portfolio management and trading activities, what sort of compliance policies and procedures are around those assets. Um, in the context of robo-advisors, again, compliance policies and procedures, but they're also looking at um, whether or not these uh, entities are eligible for SEC registration, um, if they're uh, complying with their fiduciary duties, what sort of marketing they're doing and that type of thing. And uh, finally, there's a focus on uh, FINRA and the MSRB. And it, again, that just goes to policies and procedures and to make sure that they're operating the way um, they're intended to. Great. I think we're just going to be, we're down to about 10 minutes left, so we're going to have to move a little bit quickly. Do you have any quick thoughts on share class construction? Is that that's an interesting development? Do we, will we have clean shares in 10 words or less? Um, we already do. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Onwards, we'll, we'll skip that one. Um, but, I, but I think we did want to spend a little bit of time on sub-advisor oversight. Um, maybe we got about sort of five minutes or so. We can, Bob and Joe, if you, you both have, maybe quickly talk about your your role now and at past shops on um, uh, on sub-advisors, overseeing them, being a sub-advisor, dealing with boards be on the compliance side and the like. Um, so my background is uh, that in my current shop, and uh, I used to work at uh, Wellington. I used to lead up the team that dealt with the sub-advisory work uh, at Wellington. So I've always been on the sub-advisor side. And um, it, it really does range, but I do think the trend has been to try to get to a place where uh, maybe there's less flexibility in terms of how people are responding to the questions that are coming in because when we just think about what we talked about on the panel, the uh, derivatives rules, the liquidity rules, there really has to be more of a focus on, okay, let's think about how this, um, you know, how, how this can work and how, how we can talk to some of the larger shops that use a lot of uh, sub-advisors to make sure that we're all on the same page. And I think communication is the big part of it. In fact, I'm pretty sure that we, we worked for one of Joe's former employers, uh, you know, as a sub-advisor at, at Wellington. But uh, it, would you agree it's become, I mean, at, at the worst side, it, it's become more of a checklist list exercise, uh, but you know. It has, um, and I think that's 
unfortunate. Right. And, and I'm still a big proponent of in-person due diligence. Yeah. Um, so you get these checklists, in my experience. So I've dealt with sub-advisors, and I've been a sub-advisor, or a firm has. And they look great on paper. And then you go and visit them, and you're right. like, what? I, I mean, we had a hedge fund that we were looking to hire into a mutual fund. Um, and the, the response came back, and it was, uh, they were all about segregation of assets, right? I sit down with the GC, and I say, so how are you segregating for cash total futures? And he goes, well, we work with our outside counsel on that. I go, yeah, but how are you doing it? Well, they weren't doing it because they were a hedge fund. Um, so those are things that I think, you know, those tangible, intangibles that you get by doing in-person due diligence, I think there's, there's nothing like it. Um, but I would agree it's becoming more paper-based just because of the plethora of sub-advisors that, that your shops are using. Anything on board interactions and you know, some board oversight role that boards are taking and digging in or, or, that, or maybe sort of deferring out to the CCOs of the, of the manager to oversee the sub-advisory arrangements? Any thoughts on that? Yeah, sure. So um, the boards, are, the, the boards definitely delegated down to the CCO, but my experience has been that they're asking more and more for metrics. Right? They don't want right. to see a 15-page report about X sub advisor. They want to see the the powerpoints and the the infographs and who's breached so many times. So they wanted to see more metrics around it, and I think that's been serving the boards um, really well. And I, you know, I want to point out too, because I touched on it a little bit about conduct of people. Um, but again, if I had a crystal ball to think about what due diligence is going to look like in the future, um, the SEC just brought an enforcement action against the actor Kevin. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, Steven Seagal. Yeah. Um, and part of what they did there was they scrubbed his social media, where he was touting some kind of bitcoins or whatever, right? So you have to think about, uh, remind yourself you might need to scrub employees' social media. And you might be asked about that in a due diligence um, meeting. And um, the FSA in the UK is looking into the conduct of, his name is Jess Stately, he's the Barclays CEO, because of his relationship with um, the now deceased Epstein, right? So what that has to do with anything in the financial services world, I don't know. Um, but what I'm saying here is we're seeing more more inquiries into conduct of right. employees. And I think that um, you'll see that in due diligence. And well, the other- The, the, the yeah. interesting thing too is, so at our board level, uh, the question has come up on topics like, well, so what are you doing in response to the Me Too movement? Yep. Which, I mean, it's an important topic, but you look and you say, that, that really has nothing to do with the funds and the things you're responsible for. But, but they care about that because Obviously, in order for the funds to be successful, you have to have a wide variety of, of talented people, yeah. and you know, if you're a terrible shop to work for, you're not going to have that. Right. And the other thing is, you do not get out of a due diligence meeting these days without explaining your diversity and inclusion policy, yeah. point blank. You need to be able to explain it, and you need to have statistics around it. Um, in a lot of shops, you won't get their business if you don't have, if you can't um, get that type of reporting. Okay. Well, our remaining. A uh, few minutes. I uh, want to just touch a little bit on board outreach, the IM outreach process that happened last year, um, and then some of the uh, last year's and now this yesterday's uh, exemptive. Uh, sorry, excuse me. Um, uh, uh, no action relief on uh, uh, on in-person meetings. So, Andrea, maybe you can kind of bring us home here with with you know the the, the outreach from the staff from the staff to the industry uh, on board acti actions and, and what we're going to do now that now that coronavirus is here to stay for a little bit. I'm still hoping to go on spring break. Um, so. Um, I hope everyone has heard of the Board Outreach Initiative. Um, as George mentioned, we've been um, working on it for a couple years now, and it started out um, as reviewing pretty much everything um, that the commission or the staff has ever said or done or required of boards, um, and then going and reaching out to boards themselves and asking them, you know, what's working for you? Where are the pressure points? Is there anything that we can help you out with? Um, talking to their councils, talking to their auditors, CCO is pretty much everybody. Um, and you know, I think a lot of other initiatives in the division right now have were born out of this process. Um, 
what you saw last year were a couple of no action letters, one in the affiliated transaction space um, where the rules require the board to make a determination about whether or not the transactions enacted under their rules were done in accordance with those rules. Um, now they can rely on a written representation uh, from the CCO, which I think is in keeping with 38A1, which came out after all those affiliated transaction rules. And then last February, uh, there was no action relief issued in the context of in-person meetings, and this is where we get to coronavirus, because um, just yesterday, the staff put out an info update on its website that extends that relief. Um, so the way the no action position works, it actually covers two circumstances. One is unforeseen or emergency situations, and then another is um, in-person meetings that have happened previously, so where the board met um, once before in person, but for whatever reason didn't take a vote at that time. In the context of the unforeseen or emergency circumstances, last year's relief only extended to renewals of agreements and arrangements. And so as you can imagine, we've been getting a lot of calls, um, folks not wanting to travel right now, and um, with in-person meetings coming up, um, and advisory agreements uh, that people want to vote on. So yesterday, the relief um, that was given in the info update, as I mentioned, extends um, what was in the no action letter last year for all approvals and all renewals, including material changes, until June 15th. Okay. And we'll, I guess, see what happens when June 15th rolls around. Um, yes. uh, are there any questions? Because I think we're sort of at the end of time. We've got this clock says two minutes, but I think we're over the time we were supposed to end. Anybody have any questions or concerns of, of what we talked about uh, today? Well, hearing none, seeing none, I uh, want to thank our uh, panelists uh, and uh, want to thank you all for sitting attentively and hopefully uh, you enjoy the rest of the conference and hopefully this is a helpful building block for, for everything else you'll be seeing and discussing uh, between now and tomorrow. So thank you very much. Thank you.